que ya viene la revolución, para que se asustan será pa' mejor. Es el pueblo entero el que ya está gritando, ¡Viva la revolución! Iranian nuclear weapons development. They have turned the island into a communist hellhole. The experiment in Venezuela has failed completely. La bestialidad imperialista. Bestialidad que no tiene una frontera determinada ni pertenece a un país determinado. Bestias fueron las hordas hitleristas, como bestias son los norteamericanos hoy, como bestias son los paracaidistas belgas, como bestias fueron los imperialistas franceses en Argelia. Porque es la naturaleza del imperialismo la que bestializa a los hombres la que la convierte en fieras sedientas de sangre que están dispuestas a degollar, a asesinar, a destruir hasta la última imagen de un revolucionario, de un partidario de un régimen que haya caído bajo su bota o que luche por su libertad. Y la estatua que recuerda a Lumumba, hoy destruida pero mañana reconstruida, nos recuerda también en la historia trágica de ese mártir de la revolución del mundo, que no se puede confiar en el imperialismo, pero ni tantito así, nada. Thank you. 
that is the Bengali version of one of the most beautiful songs ever written in history, a revolutionary song, The Internationale, by our comrades in Bangladesh and India, uh, all Bengal, Bengali people. Uh, long live the revolutionary history of India, Bang Bangladesh, Pakistan, the Bengali uh, sisters and brothers all over the world in the diaspora, and all people struggling against empire, against capitalism, imperialism, neocolonialism. What's up, everybody? Uh, welcome to episode 82, Unmasking Imperialism, Exposing Imperialist Propaganda in Mainstream Media. Today, exposing Dinesh D'Souza and his capitalist and imperialist propaganda, somebody who himself is from the Indian subcontinent, but promotes the interests of his white savior overlords, his capitalist overlords, and is colonized, a colonized man who, in my opinion, is sick in the head. And we're going to debunk some of his claims about the so-called free market, about capitalism. Uh, we're going to talk about why his analysis of Western political systems are flawed. He believes the U.S. is the best country in the world. Uh, we're also going to talk about the prevalence of right-wing ideology within the South Asian diaspora of North America and Europe. It's something that's not really talked about in online left spaces in particular, but I find it fascinating. Me and Ophelia always talk about this all the time, how many immigrants who come to the U.S. and Canada and the U.K. are indoctrinated with a free market capitalist ideology and how it creates a division between uh, Indian as and Pakistani and Bengali migrants and, and migrants from Latin America and Africa. Uh, we're also going to talk about revolutionary communist movements in India and Bangladesh, how they're resisting capitalism and imperialism, leading the way and resisting a system that exploits them. And also talking about plurinationalism, what does it mean in South Asia? What does it mean here in uh, North America, Turtle Island, where uh, me and Comrade Bilavo are, are speaking from? And also what does plurinational mean, uh, plurinationalism mean in Venezuela, where uh, Comrade Saheli is joining us? And as I mentioned, joining us today are two amazing comrades of mine, uh, Saheli uh, Chaudhuri, who is uh, a Bengali millennial interested in history and popular movements in the global south. She works for the Venezuela-based online news outlet, Orinoco Tribune. Please subscribe to Orinoco Tribune. The link is in the description. An amazing uh, team of comrades down there in Venezuela doing really amazing work. Uh, Comrade Saheli, how are you doing this evening? Okay. First of all, <laughs> thanks a lot, Ramiro, for uh, inviting me to this uh, space because like, I have been watching you for a long time and this is like a dream come true so thank you and secondly <laughs> yeah sure and uh, secondly thanks for playing the bengali version of international because that's something that uh, i mean not many people would hear in the west surely so thanks a lot for that also okay i'm fine I'm doing fine so looking forward to the entire show and uh, talk about whatever you wish thank you so much uh, comrade saheli and i appreciate that honestly i i'm flattered by that uh, and thank you for supporting my work and other people's work. Uh, you you really represent independent revolutionary journalism with Orinoco Tribune and all the other work that you do. And I, I find it fascinating that you know you're in Venezuela. You came from uh, from South Asia, and I think you have a lot of interesting uh, stories to share. And I think that's really cool the international spirit that you have. And also just to say, just to add that. In Bangladesh, I went to Bangladesh, uh, I believe it was 2012 or 2013, I, I can't remember exactly the year. Uh, and that was one of the times, uh, about 10 years ago, actually. And going to Bangladesh and meeting real communists and seeing what a real communist movement looks like, committed myself to revolution and to activism. And that was life-changing for me. I was there for two weeks. I traveled to Dhaka. I went to uh, to the south part of uh, Chittagong uh, in southern Bangladesh and uh, uh, Bari Sal and just meeting uh, communist Bengalis like that changed my life forever. That was amazing. Uh, when I was out there, everybody kept calling me uh, Che because they had never seen like a Latino guy before and they were communist. So, like, oh, <laughs> so they were they were they were we, we had a joke about that, too. And I have the uh, Che Guevara. Hold on. Let's see if I have. Yeah, I have, I have a tattoo of Che Guevara signature. So I just kept showing them that. I was nice. like, oh, Che, Che. Uh, and joining us as well is Comrade B-Level, host of Ewoks Unhinge, a podcast with a focus on internationalism and anti-imperialism from a revolutionary Pan-American perspective. 
B level is of Bengali and Celtic descent, currently residing in Canada, where he raises awareness for a socialist Republican movement based on the principles of plurinationalism, which we're going to talk about later today, to smash Anglo-American hegemony over Turtle Island, a.k.a. North America, and build a real future for all peoples. B-Level, how's it going, brother? Hey, thank you so much. Always awesome to be back on Unmasking Imperialism. I wanted to add to the Sister Saheli, it's a real dream of mine as well to connect with other people in our diaspora. Uh, it, it's really great. You know, there aren't many of us out here making the content that we that we make. So it's, it's really awesome. And Romero, uh, this kind of goes to the, the importance of diaspora media, because I mean, me and Saheli, we could get on a stream with Timmy G and Dr. Hassan Ali tomorrow, and we'd be like the first South Asian podcast for the diaspora. I haven't seen really, I've looked for media like that, and it just doesn't exist. Meanwhile, you got these characters like Dinesh D'Souza just running amok saying all this <laughs> is utterly wild stuff. So when I saw the episode with uh, you and Dr. Jared, Ball of uh, Black Power Media debunking Thomas Soul. I hit you up and like, yo, we should do Dinesh. And it was yeah. a joke, but for real, I, it's good. And because like, people, when I started, they they asked me because I had South Asian heritage. They're like, oh, B-Level, you should talk about that more. And when I started, I'm like, well, you know, I'm like second generation born. I'm a mixed kid. Do I really have anything to offer? That's what I thought initially. But I realized that diaspora media is really uh, desperately needed in, in the belly of the beast. So that really committed me to making this content. And the example that you've set with Latin American and Caribbean media has really inspired me myself to connect with cousins like Saheli. And also shout out to my man, Himi G. He couldn't make it today. He's another brother in the diaspora of Nepali descent. Really intelligent guy. Check out his channel because uh, he, he does some great analysis on this as well. But but for the uh, zoo, let's get into Distort the Susa because it's going to be a wild ride. Most most definitely. Thank you, uh, B-Level. appreciate that. May, please make sure, uh, everybody watching and listening, please subscribe to Ewoks and Hinge. Link is in the description as well. Amazing content there. Uh, just to kick off the episode, something I've been uh, doing recently, quote of the day, quote related to the topic of conversation that we're talking about. Uh, this is uh, Indian comrade uh, Bhagat Singh. Uh, from, and this is a, a really beautiful post from the All India Democratic Students Organization. I actually met a good comrade from the All India Democratic Students Organization in Bangladesh as well. She was really dope. Uh, and she was also involved with the Communist Party of India Marxist. Uh, Bhagat Singh was a Indian revolutionary communist and freedom fighter. He was born in 1907, September, and died in March 1931. So he died very young. He took part in uprisings against British colonialism and capitalism and was inspired by Marxism and revolutionary nationalism. And he's considered by many in the left in India to be a, a national hero against colonialism and one of the founding fathers of Indian Marxism. Uh, this is a quote from him, quote, the workers, in spite of being the most necessary element of society, are robbed by their exploiters of the fruits of their labor and deprived of their elementary rights. The peasant who grows corn for all starves with his family. The weaver who supplies the world market with textile fabrics has not enough to cover his own and his children's bodies. And masons, smiths, and carpenters who raise magnific magnificent palaces live like pharaohs in the slums uh sorry live like pariahs in the slums the capitalists and exploiters the parasites of society squander millions on their whims this state of affairs cannot last long the present order is a society and merrymaking is on the brink of a volcano a radical change therefore is necessary and it is the duty of those who realize it to reorganize society on a socialist basis this is Again, uh, Bhagat Singh, one of the national heroes of, of India, a revolutionary a communist, uh, kicking off that quote just to show the radical roots of India. Because it's interesting, a lot of people on the left in the U.S. in particular wouldn't associate Marxism and communism uh, with India or Bangladesh or Pakistan. They all think, oh, every, they get here. They love their hardworking American patriots. They love America. They love capitalism. The end. But if you actually go to South Asia, if you go to Bangladesh, India, uh, Pakistan, you'll meet some of the most militant communists. And in fact, one of the biggest and most successful communist groups now, in my opinion, one of the best communist parties, I think now in, in India, the Communist Party of India Marxists, 
uh, are doing some really amazing work. And so uh, this is sort of to debunk that this kind of notion that all uh, South Asians are right wing or that they love colonialism and, and capitalism. And so now that we've kicked that off, uh, I just quickly want to explain a little bit about Dinesh. Who is Dinesh D'Souza? Uh, this is him. Uh, we're looking a pic at a picture of him right now. Uh, Dinesh D'Souza on the left with Ronald Reagan, one of uh, the satanic spawns himself, an uh, evil, evil man who has done <laughs> a lot of fucking crazy shit. Uh, Ronald Reagan, who was responsible for funding the, the, the Contras in Nicaragua, funding death squads, uh, mur supporting a, a, a Zionist evangelical government in Guatemala that murdered uh, tens of thousands of indigenous communists. Uh, really horrible guy. Uh, so that's Dinesh with Ronald Reagan on the left. On the right, that is Dinesh D'Souza with Richard Nixon, another uh, piece of shit, a right winger from uh, the U.S. former president. And Dinesh D'Souza was born April 25th, 1961, uh, Indian American right wing political commentator, provocateur, author and filmmaker. He's written over a dozen books that some of them have been New York Times bestsellers. Uh, one of his most famous documentaries uh, Obama's America, where he basically critiques the Democrats. And not to say, I think, like, I I agree with some of his critiques of the Democrats, how they uh, exploit ID poll and stuff like that yeah. uh, for their purposes. Uh, but obviously, he's coming from the right wing. He also has several other documentaries, America, Imagine the World Without Her, Hillary's America, The Death of a Nation, Trump Card, uh, and, and Mule, 20, 2000 Mules. Uh, Dinesh D'Souza was born in Bombay, or aka Mumbai, uh, he moved to the United States as an exchange student and graduated from Dartmouth College, and he became a naturalized citizen in 1991. So he is an immigrant uh, to the U.S. Uh, and from 2010 to 2012, he was president of the King's College of Christian School in New York City until he resigned uh, because of a scandal. He's also been involved with some other scandals revolving around political campaigns and money. Uh, but basically, long story short, to cut it short, he is like the Indian um, uh, version of Candace Owens. He's like the model yeah. minority being uh, paraded around by the right-wing evangelical Zionist neocons who love, uh, quote-unquote, America, who love capitalism. Uh, and so, you know, he's somebody who has millions and millions of views. This guy is very influential. Mm. And in fact, before I left New York, uh, I'm from born and raised in New York, uh, I had a lot of uh, Indian friends who I went to high school with. They weren't even necessarily political. And he's very influential within the uh, Indian immigrant community. So this is why we're talking about him. Because, again, these are the I like uh, the yeah. word uh, B-level uses pick that are used mm. to parrot the talking points of imperialism and capitalism. So uh, just to start off, uh, Comrade Saheli, your initial thoughts on uh, Dinesh D'Souza. What have you heard about him uh, and what is your perspective on somebody like him as a South Asian comrade, a person from south asia but not in the belly of the beast like like me and b level okay so first of all before before starting to talk about dinesh i would like to say something because you had yeah. uh, put up the quota for bhagat singh so like just you said he died very young well he was he didn't die he was killed he was mm -hmm. hanged to death because of his uh, revolutionary activities and like it was not even like he had killed anyone or anything. He had just drawn, dro dropped a um, very uh, like, sort of very low power bomb in the assembly in order to attract the attention of everyone that the British were colonizing India and what they were doing. So he had not even killed anyone. He had just dropped a bomb and he was considered a terrorist for that. And he was hanged to that. So that's something. Uh, that's what I wanted to add. Like, uh, otherwise, people would think, why, why would he die so young, right? Right. Yeah. yeah no. Thank like, you for clarifying uh, he, that. He was he was hanged to death. So yeah, he was a uh, he was one of the not one of the founders, but one of the most important figures of the militant mm. uh, movement, uh, militant independent movement in India. So he is uh, at least held in high esteem among uh, those in India who actually supported or still want to still support revolutionary ideals. So that's that's what I wanted to say. Okay, about Dinesh D'Souza, I, like, you know, I this is not my uh, speciality of um, what Indians or uh, South Asians in general in the United States do or anything. But yes, I had, uh, actually, there is something that any South Asian person who does well 
in the United States is considered some sort of hero among uh, their counterparts in India, Bangladesh, etc. For example, uh, earlier this, not this year, I mean, when um, uh, Biden won, and then when he was like, when his inauguration yes. was going on, <laughs> yes, and they were like, Kamala Harris, who had nothing to do with India, I mean, who does not even, who wasn't, uh, doesn't live here, I mean, he doesn't live in India, he wasn't, she wasn't born, or she has got nothing to do with India, and yet, people were like, wow, an Indian is becoming the vice president of the United States. And I was like, no, an Indian isn't. She is, a, <laughs> she is also like that sort of person, like a, uh, like a figure that figurehead that you show off to say that yeah, this, this Indian or this South Asian is doing so great in the United States. So everyone should be moving to that place and uh, dreaming of achieving that. So that's that's the bar that is set for uh, South Asians, not just in the, the terrible bar, at, but at home also. Yeah, so that's that's something. So that's I I would like to put in this perspective the case of Dinesh D'Souza also, and that fact that he has been a New York Times bestseller and he has had some like very influential, let's say, documentaries, etc., uh, has has made it, him a hero in. Uh, at least among the educated circles in India also. Not everyone knows him, but uh, at least those who read and speak English, etc., would know him. So that's that's something. I call this thing that this thing of um, Indians doing very well in the West, especially in the Anglophone West, I call mm. this uh, thing colonial hangover. That is... Uh, <laughs> that's a good term. I like, I'm going to use that. I'm going to use that. <laughs> Okay, thanks. So yeah, I mean, I had heard of post-colonial hangover, and I thought, no, this is exactly colonial hangover. So th that is my thought about Dinesh. Firstly, that not about him, but why his work could be influential among Indians in general living in uh, US, as well as, let's say, those Indians who would know him. Yeah, no, I think that's a great breakdown, uh, Comrade Sahali. I think that he, it's uh, interesting because I grew up my whole life around uh, Indians, from, uh, Pakistanis, Bengalis, my whole life uh, in, in New York. And some of them were my closest friends. Some of them were my neighbors. And it's very true. I think that many uh, of the, the migrants will take pride in somebody ascending to these key positions. And that's not a bad thing, right? Because here's the thing, like as, as leftists, as communists, we also have to understand our people, our masses and our populations and mm. understand that we respect uh, we respect meritocracy, we respect success. We want people to be doctors and lawyers and professors. It's not that we're against that, but it's who are those institutions serving? Who are those institutions financing in terms of the Democrats, the imperialist powers? And it's the same thing with the many other oppressed groups in the Global South migrants. Like, okay, what does it matter if we have a Latino as the head of immigration, if he's still yeah. doing raids on, on, on Latino immigrants. So uh, I think it's a, a really good uh, analysis, Comrade Saheli. Uh, Comrade B-Level, your uh, overview initially, before we get into some of the material of Dinesh D'Souza, who do, what does he mean to you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And as uh, Kamar Saheli said, rest in power to the eternal comrade Bhagat Singh. Yo, if kids, if the South Asian kids out there want role model, look to him. Don't look to uh Dinesh out here but yeah I'm really looking forward to getting into all of the uh like with Dinesh I'm looking for the clips you have because he has says so much garbage we could go all sorts of directions but um yeah you know Dinesh uh, you know unlike uh the episode you did about Thomas Sowell you know Thomas Sowell really grounds all of his stuff in logic and very you know thoughtful wise man that's how he's kind of portrayed to the audiences with Dinesh he's like you said more like Candace Owens just kind of hysterical uh says pretty dumbed down points uh defending capitalism uh, what I call zero context geopolitics especially with how he refers to the wealth imbalance between the uh a uh, quote-unquote first world and third world or the global north and global south and explaining poverty and sadly these are views that a lot of folks in the diaspora actually have about poverty that uh you know the, uh, and Dinesh you know we mentioned uh, meritocracy earlier right and in a socialist society you would want meritocracy people who are innovating people that are really uh, 
bringing good things to the project. But when Dinesh speaks to meritocracy, I called him distort the Susa a number of times. That's kind of an old school nickname of him because he distorts what a meritocracy is. His main point is that capitalism is a just system. But let's just look at Britain, right? Britain's primitive accumulation was was in a very large part based on the hyper exploitation of the subcontinent. And to say that capitalism is a just system and, and like he's totally ignoring where does the wealth come from, which, you know, large part came from our peoples as well as the peoples of Africa and Latin America. And what's really terrible is that Dinesh, he often beats down on uh, oppressed nations within the United States, just as black and Latino and indigenous people. And uh, and it's terrible because you, know, you should be making those connections between what's happening here and in the global south. And Dinesh, he really espouses that model minority kind of image pushed by the right wing, which is in terms of uh, quote unquote American history is relatively new. It's something that emerged post civil rights. And we can get into that a bit later. But if anybody's curious for a really good breakdown of that, I strongly recommend the book, The Karma of Brown Folk by Vijay Prashad, which is, of course, a play on words of W.E.B. Du Bois's the soul of black folk. And it's a really good book that breaks down right wingers in the South Asian diaspora. There's different types. Uh, the book goes into some of the more spiritual hucksters as well. And that's a whole other uh, kind of area that we probably don't have time for today. But Dinesh is the neocon of that. He is the neocon uh, really pushing that Reaganomics, saying, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. You know, it's all on you. And if you're poor, it's a moral problem. Interestingly enough, the spiritual hucksters also pretty much say the same thing, but in, in a different way. But yeah, Dinesh, very important to combat. Um, some of his explicit, uh, you know, just wild points, um, more conspirational points, maybe a bit less common, but the stuff about defending capitalism as meritocratic is uh, quite common amongst the diaspora. And we can get into this a bit later, but one more point is to the composition of the diaspora and the type of immigrants attracted to the belly of the beast changed around the time of civil rights as well. But I don't want to talk too much, Romero. I'll let you continue the show, but we can get back to that later. No worries, man. Thank you for that book recommendation. I'll definitely Yeah, yeah, it's it a good out. one. I love VJ for shot. I can't wait. I hope to get him on Ewoks uh, one day. I almost did. There was a scheduling conflict, sadly, with another record, but uh one day. No, he's he's a cool guy, man. Uh, I, I I definitely value his work in the Tricontinental. And I think it's important to have more Indian and South Asian communists out there because here's the thing, like there's no we need more role models like that as well. And it really one thing that I find kind of interesting and fascinating but also infuriating is that even though many uh, indian migrants when they come to the united states and they show respect to the united states as any you would go to any country if you're moving somewhere you would respect that country and the and the laws and the rules and and appreciate the the culture and and whatever it is right and so even like in let me just give you a quick snapshot of like where i grew up i'm from queens new york uh, and in southside queens there's a lot of uh, Indians, uh, Bengalis, Pakistanis, uh, and Punjabis, Sikhs. And everywhere you go in this neighborhood of Queens that I'm from, you'll see a lot of Sikhs who have American flags on their in front of their house. They'll have uh, construction companies with the American flag and businesses with the American flag. So even though, for example, I don't really identify with the U.S. or the American flag or the word America in general, you know, they're, they're coming at it from a different perspective. They moved here. They're respecting what they see as the the nation or the the ideas of here, but it, what's crazy is that in 2001, September 11th, right, 9/11, mm. 2001, uh, and and love I've shared this with you uh, on your stream. My yeah. first fight ever, actually, this is my first fight ever in elementary school, fifth grade. Uh, it was the beginning of the semester uh, because school just started in September. September 11th happened a few days after school started. And we had a student who just moved from India, and he was in our class, fifth grade. This is a school that is predominantly, mind you, predominantly Black and Latino, so, you know, migrant uh, family kids. And September 11th happened. Everybody's brainwashed and glued to the TV, you know, the terrorist 9-11, the terrorist 9-11. And they show Osama bin Laden, who wears a turban. Right. And Sikhs also wear turbans, Right. So what was happening in New York at this time is that you had a lot of hate crimes against Sikhs 
uh, who had a turban, who wore turbans, and who had nothing to do with 9-11 in general. That's the whole... By the way, I don't even think, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get into 9-11 another time. There's two. Yeah, yeah. To make that By the way, for but, anybody uh, wondering, we have a really good episode on 9-11 we did on the 20th anniversary on my channel. So make sure to check that out. Uh, we, we went into it there quite a bit. Yeah, no, it, it was, a, it was a, a great combo. And so basically, so the student came. He was a nice dude and nobody wanted to talk to him. And I felt it was really fucked up because everybody kept calling him a terrorist. Uh, everybody kept saying you bombed the Twin Towers and all this horrible stuff. He barely spoke English. He was from mm. uh, India, from Punjab. Like, he had no idea what was going on. And these kids, they started messing around with his turban. They took off, the, uh, started unraveling his turban. They started pulling his hair. And I jumped in. You know, I was his yeah. only friend at the time. Uh, that was my first fight, fighting two other kids. And then he got into it, too. Like, he, me and him were fucking up the two kids. Uh, fifth grade in New York City public schools um and again is is it, it wasn't like these were white kids like that you see in the movies with the the letterman jacket and the locker and they're like get out of our country these are like black and latino kids in the hood indoctrinated with this u.s patriotism bullshit of like you know you're a terrorist you're horrible um and so even though like his family and his, and his community they respected the u.s they admired the u.s and they had all this you know support for the u.s the very same people in that country were beating him up and calling him a terrorist. And this is part of what Saheli was mentioning about like colonial hangups. And why mm. is it that our people, even though we've been colonized by these empires, the, the U S and England, we're still bowing down to them. We're still kissing at their feet mm. and please, and thank you. And give us a little slice of, if we just dress up like them, They'll respect us, you know, and this is what Dinesh just Me and Romero have like, both like, done that. We both went to college. We both wore the dress shirts buttoned up. I mean, I also wear dress shirts sometimes, but, you know. <laughs> and, no, most uh, definitely. Yeah. And uh, Philly, um, Philly, Philly, Philly Hamalama said, I remember the Wisconsin Sikh Temple shooting in 2012. So sad. Yeah, it's fucked up. There's so many examples, dude. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, But what I want to do, uh, I want to play a clip. This is Dinesh D'Souza. Uh, yeah, I wanted to give that that kind of preface to to yeah. have this discussion because you know this is what uh Dinesh and, and it's important because all of our groups at different times all of our groups will be pegged as enemies of empire you know like it can be black people one day it will be latinos the next it will be south asians and chinese and that international solidarity is so important to remember our enemies are in wall street and the city of London that pushed this global white supremacist agenda, that pushed this Anglo-American hegemony and imperialism. I remember the other week I was getting into it with someone in our diaspora who is not can Latinos. And I'm like, like you got a colonized mind right there. That you're attacking other brown folks in the belly of the beast who are our comrades in struggle against the hegemony that oppresses our homelands, you know, our subcontinent. It's, uh, it's unfortunate. Yeah. No, most definitely, man. And, um, you know, so I think it's important to discuss these things. Um, so this is a clip from Dinesh D'Souza. It's called, uh, it's all about the money. Dinesh D'Souza proves that Marx was wrong about capitalism. We're going to talk about this and, and talk about his understanding of Marxism. Here in Palo Alto, there's a Ritz-Carlton, there's a Weston. Now imagine a guy who is a valet parking cars at the Ritz-Carlton here in Palo Alto. And this guy is paid, let's say, $15 an hour. And let's say that he works 10 hours a day, so he makes 150 bucks. And this guy is now thinking to myself, in those 10 hours, how many cars did I park? Well, I parked, let's say, 100 cars. And how much does the Ritz-Carlton charge for someone to park their car? $30. So how much did the Ritz-Carlton make as a result of me parking those 100 cars? $3,000. And how much was I paid out of that $3,000? $150. 3,000 minus 150 gives $2,850. Who gets that? So from the valet's point of view, this is a very unjust system because I'm doing the work and some other guy is taking the cash. And this argument about the injustice of capitalism is actually anchored in, I think, uh, a rather interesting argument that was made by Marx himself. And so there's a big difference between the revenue generated by the sales and the cost. 
And that difference Marx calls surplus value. We call it profit. And Marx's question, uh, quite a profound question, who gets that? Now Marx's assumption is that that belongs 100% to labor. Why? Because labor made the goods. The capitalists supplied nothing more than the money, which has already been recompensed through interest. My view is that this description, convincing as it is on first glance, is a completely false representation of how businesses actually run. Consider for a moment the capitalist. In America today, the vast majority of capitalists supply a lot of things, but the one thing they do not supply is capital. Did Steve Jobs actually put up all the capital for Apple? No, he went to a bank. The bank supplied the capital. And this is true of Gates and all, everyone down the list. The bottom line of it, the capitalist supplies three things that Marx completely ignores that are actually of far greater value than capital and actually entitle the capitalist to a share of the profit. But Marx, in a sense, submerges these three factors completely. First, the capitalist has the idea for the business. Without the idea, there's no business. Labor doesn't think of the idea, the capitalist does. It's his or her idea, they do it. Second, the capitalist organizes the business. Here you have this valet, he goes, I parked the cars, I need all the money. The truth of it is the reason you're getting $30 to park a car is you're at the Ritz-Carlton. Somebody built the Ritz-Carlton, somebody thought of it, somebody paid all the capital costs, somebody took out the insurance. You didn't think of that. If you come to my house and want to park my car, I'll pay you 50 cents. So the reason that you're getting $30 is not because of you. It's not your labor that's worth $30. It's the resort that's worth $30. And you didn't create that. So the capitalist has the idea for it. He organizes it. And third, he takes all the risk. Very important factor. The capitalist gets paid at the end. If the business has a bad quarter, Steve Jobs can't go, or the current Tim Cook can't go to Apple and say, sorry, guys. I'm not going to pay you for six months. It's looking bad for us this half of the year. No, he has to pay them anyway. So labor is trading a fixed wage for security. But the entrepreneur is taking the risk that he might get nothing out of it, and he could even lose money. So the truth of the matter is that in fairly assessing the just rewards of capitalism, you have to match what the entrepreneur actually contributes. And to say it's just capital, it seems to me, is a gross misunderstanding how business is actually conducted in the United States and all around the world. Comrade Sahali, your reaction analysis to that. What do you think about <laughs> Dinesh's understanding of Marxism or what he attempts to describe as Marxism? <laughs> OK, so. First of all, wow. So there is one thing. He started with calling that person, Steve Jobs of, or whoever that person might be, started with calling them capitalist and then ended up calling them entrepreneur. So there is this thing, there is this word entrepreneur that is used uh, like, this used as if, uh, that's used like it's, a nerd or something who thinks a lot, who is like <laughs> spending spending all their time in thoughts and thinking is the one that organizes the business or whatever it might be. Now let's let's uh, just imagine first, like he talked about that resort. He said, "Who built that resort? The capitalists did. No, the capitalists did not. It was also done by labor. It's like." The entire thing was built by labor, first of all. First of all, the fact that the capitalists got that place for that resort was by displacing people already from that place. Let's, uh, let's remember that there is no such thing as a place without a people or something like that. So first of all, that. Secondly, he, that capitalist exploited labor, whoever built that, exploited labor to build that. Okay. And third, they, they are again like this one when this person is parking the car and all that that is also an exploitation so these are the different levels of exploitation that Dinesh fails to mention or maybe does not think about okay so 
secondly it's like I, I, the idea is that there can be no business without or there can be no organization without capitalist and the private capital it comes from there that private capital is the more efficient one than the public ones and then um, all private businesses and private everything is more efficient than public ones because we'll come to the because later we generally see that they are more efficient why so let's uh, start with uh, his words that it's the capitalist who organizes the business no you can have an organization of any business without a capitalist also like if workers had formed a collective where there were different kinds of workers not just someone who is parking the car but everyone like if that resort and the entire place did not belong to one person or one family or one group but belong to a collective of workers who worked there and who maintained that place then in case you would not be needing the capitalist you would be doing like it would be the workers doing it and this was the idea of let's uh, remember this was the idea of the ussr and this was why it is still so vilified that so that people would not think about it that think about its basics and everything that the common people the working class people was building and building better what we have been told for centuries that the capitalist can do so this is uh, these are the things that uh, these people these um uh, apologists for capitalism and private capital always fail to mention or do not think about or they know but they do not want us to think about them and start asking questions most definitely i have to agree with you there comrade saheli and i'm actually interested in the fact that he mentioned surplus value because it's something that a lot of people on the right never talk about and it's something that you know marx even talks about in death in in capital is the basis of capitalism and he says that the right wingers and capitalists call it profit and we call it surplus value and i'm surprised that he mentions it but at the same time he fails to kind of explain why it is that that surplus value belongs to the capitalists and the bosses and not to the workers even though the workers produce it and even the the fact that he says you know the capitalist comes up with the idea well that's fucking dumb because it's like the idea is always going to be there like for example it's not like if you go to india and some British capitalist colonial dude. Entrepreneur. Like, I have I have an idea. <laughs> yeah, I'm an entrepreneur. I have a brilliant idea. Yeah. I'm going to create a, a, a water purification system. <gasps> you know what? We never thought about that. That's such a great <laughs> idea. You know what? All the money belongs to you. No shit. Like people thought about that. You know, it's like it's so that's yeah. such a dumb excuse. And I hear that shit over and over when people are like, oh, well, I come came up with the idea. So therefore, all the profit belongs to me. I, so that's fucking dumb. But uh, B-level, your analysis to... to yeah, Dinesh that that was actually yeah. the very first clip of Dinesh D'Souza I ever watched. I think that was like Turning Point USA or something like that. And I kind of, you know, he's doing the basic kind of conservative uh, meme, not meme, but viral moments. They, I, they, He's that kind of guy. And Dinesh D'Souza, he really is, um, you know, there's a really popular model going around called the iceberg model for analyzing deep dives. Basically, Dinesh is like iceberg. And the deeper you go, the wilder his takes get. And I, I have seen him do that one quite a bit, saying the capitalists are entitled to the wealth. And as both Ramiro and Saheli pointed out, well, well, why? Because the workers are the one that are, you know, producing. They're the ones that are bringing the wealth. And I think... Um, you know, in preparation for this, I watched the Nesh. Um, it was an hour and a half. I couldn't get through it all. I watched an hour of it on the Patrick Bet David podcast. He's this uh, Persian emigre capitalist, and they were both chopping it up about how America was the best country in the world and that meritocracy and anybody can uh, climb that ladder. And, uh, you know, the Nesh, he does a lot of zero context geopolitics. Um, and going to the model minority thing, right, a lot of what Dinesh and the, the GOP Republicans, when they're looking at, for example, Black and Latino communities, they're saying, oh, the disintegration of the family, where look at these model uh, Asian immigrants, they have these strong family units or these strong careers, right? Well, it's zero context because leading up to the civil rights movement and for a while, Asian immigration was 
banned or very extremely restricted, depending on the locale, for a very long time in North America, from roughly the late 1800s to the 1960s. Um, the reason Asian immigration was opened again was actually in parallel to the Civil Rights Act, there was the 1965 Immigration Act. And Cold War liberals like JFK wanted to initiate this to make the uh, the United States look less racist, because the uh, <laughs> which it was racist. But the uh, Soviet Union, especially after Emmett Till, they were calling them out saying, hey, you're saying you're the free world, but look at, look at you, present house of nations right there. So the Immigration Act was to open up immigration and make the U.S. seem like more open, not just uh, uh, generally white immigrants from... Uh, uh, they did have Mediterraneans and Slavs, but mainly their goal was north Northwestern Europe as, as the whites. And so they opened it up to more folks. But in contrast to previous waves of Asian immigration, which is mostly manual labor, often referred to as the coolies, uh, quote unquote, which was sometimes a derogatory term. Now in a lot of uh, pan-Asian North American spaces, we're kind of using that more of in a reclaimed way, kind of a cool way. But yeah, that was uh, used as a derogatory term back in the day. And manual laborers was really who they're bringing in. Now, in the 1960s, what the, who they wanted to attract were like high skill, quote unquote, immigrants, people with uh, technical skills. And so you'd bring in a lot of people with degrees such as uh, doctors and engineers and scientists. And my grandfather would count as one of these, these folks as well. Um, so a lot of the Asian immigrants they're bringing in, and this is where Dinesh does zero context geopolitics, because the Indian state you know, it wasn't just families and genetics and all this cringe. It was the Indian state that was investing into the education of their people, which is something entirely omitted by American right-wingers when they talk about the high levels of education of a lot of these people who came from roughly like middle classes within the, the subcontinent who came over here as uh, technical workers. Um, and so that's model minority thing is a huge distortion because for the longest time it was manual laborers coming. And we're starting to see that come back more Bangladeshi manual laborers. And as well, that trend never changed. If you look at the Persian Gulf states, a lot of their accumulation is based off of the near slave labor of uh, Bangladeshis and other uh, migrants from Asia who are working there. And uh, But when it comes to what's... Uh, uh, Dinesh says he's not looking at the uh, fact it was the Indian state that was investing into people to become engineers and doctors and scientists. Now, look, let's look at the nations that he's knocking within the United States. For example, black and Latino communities and, and in the ghettoized areas and inner cities, as well as the First Nations on reserves. Are they communities and nations that the United States government has been investing in? that has been lifting up, trying to get people to their max potential to become scientists and engineers, especially around the 60s? Absolutely not. So that's an example of where if you actually look at the context of racialized communities and nations in the United States, compared to how in the immediate post-colonial period, the Nehru Fabian socialist government, which wasn't Marxist socialist, there's a difference there, but we're investing in their people. That's a huge difference that right-wingers like Dinesh never bring up. Um, yeah, so uh, sorry if I went on a bit of a tangent there, but I just wanted to give that history because it's a lot of stuff that's omitted from the from the conversation. Well said, uh, B-Level. So, Hal, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, okay, yeah, I'd like to add a very, little bit that when, uh, uh, like, yes, uh, it, for, for a long, long time, like all over, um, the, all over the American continent, not just in the U.S. or Canada, but even in Cuba, in uh, the in Caribbean and yeah. also in the South American continent, there were South Asians, like Indians, people who would now be Indians, Bangladeshis, Pakistanis, Sri Lankans, Nepalese, all sorts of people, and Southeast Asians, Chinese. They were really all manual labor work, even working in plantations and near slave labor conditions mm. in the Caribbean states. So, like if you Go in the Caribbean countries, especially the English speaking Caribbean countries, as well as the Spanish speaking ones like Cuba, Dominican Republic, you will see people of South Asian descent. And will, these are the people that had been taken there uh, through a system called agreement, but it was yeah. actually bonded labor. And that was how they had gone there. And they were the ones who were called, were the ones who would be called coolies or etc but they were like manual labor especially plantation labor or construction mm. labor so it was on their wealth that uh, 
large part of the modern development of the Americas was built also not just on exploiting the indigenous people and the black people, but also Asians. So that's something that's very yeah. important. And yes, the other thing that is happening at present, especially in case of the US, that the people who migrate there, unlike the Central American migrants, these people are like B-level said, these are the skills people, educated people. First of all, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, these places, are in the US, there is a huge difference. So you cannot just march in caravans and go into the US like that. Yeah, there's an ocean, of, right? <laughs> yeah, there are oceans. Like you would have to cross the Pacific or the Atlantic. So the, yeah, yeah. I mean, you cannot do that. So one would need money and one would also need the education because what will they do once they are there? Okay, so it's it's only reachable for educated people like uh, to be able to go there first of all and this is what uh, this is a phenomenon that's uh, um, happening not just in like all over the third world countries as well as in eastern europe this is what we call brain drain or the drain mm. of just like the wealth drain in the earlier century they are doing a brain drain today that attracting people from these countries with higher salaries and more perks saying that because they know that when these people will be in the US, they will be working very hard. They would be like trying to integrate themselves and they would actually what all immigrants do. This is not just for Asians, Asian immigrants, yeah. it's for all immigrants that they try to keep their head down and not get into trouble. They would just uh, try to work as best as they can and provide the best that, can, that they can for their families. So when this these educated people that like the US is attracting from Asia and especially from South Asia as well as from China, educated people with the higher salaries and stuff like that. And so these people, instead of remaining in their countries where they got educated, instead yeah. of uh, instead of contributing to development of their countries, their countries are false also, we can come to that later. But instead of contributing to those countries, they are moving to places where they can earn more and live more comfortably, which their own countries cannot give them. So this brain drain has been, this is also a sort of slave labor. You can call it a white collar slave labor, but it is slave labor nonetheless, because otherwise, I don't know, in the US, if someone was very highly educated, they would have to pay probably a lot more than they would be a, paying South Asians and they will also get more work and less trouble. So they're like, there's doing also all sorts some, of things. There's some hyper exploitation yeah. around the fact when you're not a citizen, you can be taken advantage of more, yeah. more at, at work. Um, and so I wanted to add to that a lot of immigrants when they come here, a big reason that there's the higher paycheck is the incentive is to send money back home. So it's very customary for a lot of immigrants to come here and then send over half of their wages back home. That's, for example, what my grandfather did when he came here. He was sending over half his wages back home and still donates back to, to, to the subcontinent. So that And that's a big... Um, actually, a lot of the 1965 Immigration Act was leveled to... It was basically they want our labor, but not our lives. They don't really want us to become citizens here. And that's the whole poll. The whole question of it's like, well, if there's this desire for a white America then why why are they attracting immigrants? Or if they want a white America, then why did they bring slaves over from Africa, right? They want to exploit and hyper-exploit people, but they don't want them here. Something especially sick, and this is primarily targeted towards the Chinese diaspora, although there were South Asians involved in this as well, is uh, Sir John A. Macdonald, the uh, raging white supremacist, first prime minister of the Confederation Dominion of Canada. He, he was instrumental in pacting passing the uh, Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. But then, of course, you know, uh, turns around and gets, uh, they bring in coolies to build the railroads, right? The Canadian Pacific Railroad, which was one of the highest cases of racialized uh, labor in Canada. Look at that guy, just demonic, right? Dude, he looks like <laughs> but, a fucking spawn of devil. Look at his, yeah, his face. Yeah, it's, it, this guy is crazy. This guy is absolutely crazy. But yeah, you know, and so you can see that mirrored in the 1965 Immigration Act, right, is that they they want the talent, they want people's training and skills, but they don't want them to be Americans or Canadians long term. And that's why as well, when Dinesh talks about the nuclear family, that's actually not a model that's very common in South Asia. 
extended multi-generational families are far more common. But as Saheli mentioned, you've got an entire ocean between folks and it's expensive to come over. So generally, uh, you'll just come over maybe sometimes just the man is sent, sometimes a couple will be sent and they're kind of more in a nuclear family mode, but that's not what it was uh, ba back home. But the intention is really not to bring the whole family over. Uh, they want to keep people apart. And there is almost the general sentiment that for a lot of folks, they'll retire in the homeland. That here they are the forever immigrant. There's a term, I believe it's called the forever foreign. That is a term applied to Asian immigrants. And I think we should get to that later because the Nesh, he says that it's much easier for uh, Indians to and Pakistanis and Bangladeshis to be like, naturalized and feel American or feel Canadian mm -hmm. here than in Britain. And to be honest, um, I don't really see much of a difference of that process for here or for Britain, uh, from what I understand, because I have relatives in both areas. And there is the stigma of the forever, uh, forever foreign. And, and I mentioned myself, you know, I'm a mixed kid. I'm basically the South Asian equivalent of a mestizo or a mulatto, right? And, you know, I'm still, as you'll probably seen as alien by many people. And I'm born here. I'm second generation. I can like only speak English. But, you know, that forever foreign concept applies to, to so many folks. So I would like to challenge our our Uncle Dinesh on this this point. And Vijay Prashad gets into <laughs> that in Karma Brown Folk as well. And that's the thing. When will Dinesh debate Vijay Prashad? He's only debating like first year <laughs> college students. I want to see him debate his peer and actually get into it. Anyway, most definitely, yeah. And uh, just as a shout out to Comrade Obi, uh, the desire to increase specialized labor pool to suppress wages, but to export this cost to the global south. That's exactly right, and that's exactly what Saheli was mentioning as well with brain drain and taking the best and brightest minds from the global south and basically fucking up their economies. Because when you're taking all the doctors and engineers. Mm from a country you're destroying its economy. And also what we're seeing in the screen, these are uh, Punjabi workers uh, in Canada built, who built the railroads uh, in the Western mm. Pacific coast of Canada uh, in the 1800s. Very uh, interesting history. I love historical photos. Yeah. You can Looking learn fresh a lot in that from photo. It. Looking mad fresh, dude. That's what Dinesh wishes he, if he leveled, chatted yeah. up, uh, that's what he would be. But uh, I have Very another right. clip I wanna play. Uh, this is uh, Dinesh D'Souza. Talking about, uh, he credits India's, quote, success to Christianity. So here uh, he's talking about the role of Christianity, what he believes is a progressive role in, in India. So we're going to play this and talk a little bit Let's more go. about uh, British colonialism and Christianity in India. It turns out that the Portuguese found this conversion a very easy job. In fact, they found large numbers of Indians running into their arms so that the, the coercion that they were willing to use proved unnecessary. And the question is why? Uh, and the answer can be seen uh, in the distinction between the Hindu caste system, in which you have a pyramid with a small group of Brahmins or priests, and then the large group, even, even the merchant or the trader was reviled uh, as, a, as one step above the untouchable. And the untouchables were, you may say, perpetually cursed because there was no meritocratic way out of the lower caste. It didn't matter what you did or how smart you were or what you achieved, you were essentially condemned. So those guys, the moment that they heard about this other way of thinking, uh, even if the missionaries were stern, and even if they didn't live up to their precepts, the very fact that they had a precept that proclaimed universal brotherhood, that would admit into the church and into the pew side by side, uh, the, uh, uh, the white man and the brown man, the guy on top and the guy at the bottom, the very fact that it proclaimed an idea of, 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 of uh, equal dignity uh, this was hugely appealing. By the way, this was not unique to Christianity. Many Hindus converted to Islam for exactly the same reason. Islam too has the idea of universal brotherhood. It gets it from the same Abrahamic root as Christianity. So the point here is this, and that is that although I'm sure, I mean, here's where my grandfather would disagree, I'm actually glad that the stern inquisitors came because I think that while they might have been very what? to some of my ancestors, <laughs> it's been good for me. Uh, and when I think about the core values that I believe in, and I would even say it's been good for India, the fact that India is today positioned as it is uh, in Western civilization uh, is largely due to the fact that Western values came to India 
uh, involuntarily, you might say, but nevertheless, it has produced an English-speaking, technologically capable country. Uh, Gandhi said a, a generation ago that he talked about his dream, sort of similar to Martin Luther King's dream. Gandhi's dream was to wipe a tear of every Indian face. And the point here, I think, is that the, uh, India's position in the world economy and India's technological facility today gives India a better chance to achieve the Gandhian dream because of westernization rather than despite it. Crazy, crazy stuff, man. This guy Whoa. is fucking... Uh, this guy. Comrade, uh, comrade Asaheli, you're, you're, you're... This guy's uh, been colonial binge drinking right there. <laughs> I will say I'm that. I'm glad we got conquered. It's been great for me. Uh, so how your uh, analysis so, and reaction to oof. this? huge like huge talk of gandhi in order to uh, in order to whitewash okay no pun intended whitewash yeah. the british civilization is a civilization really so that's something crazy like it was first of all <laughs> uh, yeah involuntarily of course so what are western values so what were the western values that really did come to india with the british so Christianity, first of all, is not, um, whatever one might say, Christianity is not a Western religion. It, like I mean, Jesus was Palestinian, so let's remember it. So Christianity is also Arab, just as Islam is and just as Judaism is. All these three Abrahamic religions are Arab religions. And we are, these days, we are, we are used to think that Christianity and Judaism belong to Europe, whereas Islam belonged to the great unwashed hordes of Asia, but Middle East and North Africa. Anyway, and Christianity so, existed. Christianity existed in the subcontinent way before Vasco da Gama came. Like it's uh, of course. So it's like to say that Europeans brought Christianity to India is utterly false. They brought colonialism. I will say that. Yeah, so let's say what are the Western values that they brought? So the first things that they did in India. But what are the things that they caused in India? Apart from there is this, all this data now uh, about the wealth drain that the British colonialism had done from India. In today's uh, terms, it will be close to sixty trillion dollars. So that is what on which the British colonialism or UK's uh, today's uh, prosperity is built. So what? Europe is today, especially what Western Europe is today, what US is today, Canada is today, a lot of it was because of colonialism, not just of African people or the Latin American people, but also and especially because of the Asian people. In fact, if you notice a history, you would see that they had to first colonize Latin America and Africa in order to be able to colonize in order to be able to have enough wealth and power to be able to colonize Asia because the oldest civilizations, most of them existed in Asia. I'm not saying that they had, they did not have their vices or anything, but to think that Indians or Asians in general, South Asians were uncivilized and Europe brought civilization is the same civilization doctrine that is also applied in Latin America and Africa that these were civilizing missions that killing indigenous peoples were civilizing them. So they did the same thing in India, in today, in, in what today is India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, mm -hmm. as well as Iran, Iraq, Syria, everywhere, Egypt, all these places. What they did was genocide. They killed the people of these places, like millions. And these British colonial era genocides are either not remembered or the British would not want to admit that they genocided people here. Yeah. So what's wild what, is you'll have people in the diaspora praising Winston Churchill because Anglos said that dude's a national hero. And then, you know, so I got I got to check people and be like, yo, Bengal famine. You know, this dude was no friend of Indians, no friend of Africans. He only wanted to preserve their empire. That's it. That's why he was against Nazis. That's so it. The Bengal Nothing famine that he that. mentioned, the Bengal famine that B-Level mentions was during the Second World War. And it happened because the British, as well as the US soldiers who were stationed in different countries of South Asia, trying to preserve their empires, were just like robbed Indians of their food that they produced. For mm. intellect like, from 1943 to 1945, or even before 1943, they were just robbing food. And it mm. led to a famine that 
all like, obliterated from anything between two and seven million people of Bengal. So it was a, it was a genocide. It has to be called a genocide. It cannot be called anything else. And it was not the only one. And this was not the only time that yeah. it happened. It started from the 18th century, from the time that the East, East India Company was in India. So apart from like whatever else the East India Company did, they were actually the East India Company that had started transferring wealth from India to uh, Britain. So even like if you look at the documents that Marx mentions in his letters to the Tribune and other other and those times magazines. So whatever he mentions, he even quotes British documents from the House of Lords and all those places. And even they admit that like in before 1857, like before Queen Victoria took over the reign of rule of India, like when East India Company was there, even then the 9% of the then GDP of Great Britain was because of the wealth that was going from India to Britain. So it was uh, it was before like before the 1850s it was already happening and at that time the East India Company was not controlling all of India they were controlling what today is um, West Bengal Bangladesh Orissa uh, states of Bihar and Jharkhand so it's a small place and then up some parts in Western India etc so even with a third of India or less than a third of India they were having nine percent of their GDP coming from just the wealth drain that they were doing from India. So these were the values that they brought. They just killed people in those places, wherever they went, and they just took away whatever they produced. So they, and also they destroyed the social fabric, they destroyed families, they destroyed everything. Because when yeah. you have a famine, people would abandon their places of origin, they would abandon their villages. This is the same as a migration from one country to another. India is a huge country. So when one is migrating from rural to urban areas, it is like migrating from Central America to the US. That is the distances. And mm -hmm. that is the sort of thing that happened and still happens. So people were, when they were abandoning their villages, it was mostly men who were living for the cities in order to see what they could earn. And mm, those who were landlords and people like that, they would take over all the lands that belong to these poor people, whatever it was, and they would also exploit the women and children. So this was like destruction of an entire society. That was mm -hmm. the Western value that Dinesh does not mention. But they made the trains run on time to steal all the wealth. <laughs> Yeah. And you know what's interesting uh, in Ewok's community, I forget who started it, so feel free to quote me in chat, but uh, the term in, in the British, they have the term the Commonwealth to describe the white dominions and the formal co former colonies in the global south. Uh, so what we've started to say is the come and stole your wealth. So that's what the British did. And any, I, I've even seen people in the diaspora say, hey, they built a train network. But it's like, but what was that for? Was that to connect cities? Was that to connect peoples? Or is that like, it's like uh, if you look at Africa, right? The rail lines built by the European colonizers, they're like daggers that stick into the continent to take out the resources. And it's the same thing in the subcontinent. And uh, so it's wild that, you know, Dinesh says, like, it, it was under development. I strongly recommend people read Walter Rodney's book, How Europe mm -hmm. Underdeveloped Africa, because if you have some concept of the subcontinent, just look at the model they did to the African continents, how they extracted the resources and underdeveloped. And you can directly see the same strategies applied to the subcontinent. That's one thing about colonization. It really is copy paste in a lot of ways and in, uh, in subjugation. Uh, some interesting stuff is suppression of indigenous people in Canada. Some generals that were doing that in the plains here, they were the ones that were also putting down the 1857 revolts on the subcontinent. And something really interesting because Dinesh, he espouses all sorts of anti-black sentiments in his 1995 book, The End of Racism, which even some black libertarians like Glenn Lowry even said that was too much. But um, the term thug, Right, you see that term thug used a lot by right wingers to describe uh, African Americans. And um, look at uh, the, the origin of that term comes from the subcontinent. 
uh, thuggy. That is a term that was describing uh, the British used to describe the 1857 revolt. And if you look at how that was described by all the British generals, then go look at how U.S. right wingers were describing the, the the uprising in the 1960s. It's the exact same thing. It's like, why are these people mad? They should be happy. They're they're subjects of empire. And so it's it's wild that Dinesh doesn't uh, that he distorts those international connections in understanding colonialism because it really is a global system and when you have that consciousness you can see how it all interconnects and i think that's why people like him they are such a negative force because they try to keep uh immigrants in their their silos instead of connecting with other groups uh, there's a principle uh vertical integration or horizontal integration that i think is really important in understanding this and vertical is basically coming to Babylon, coming to the belly of the beast, and wanting to step on other pre-existing groups to join the white bourgeois, predominantly white bourgeoisie. Whereas horizontal integration, which is what I push at Ewoks, is joining the pre-existing groups that have been struggling against empire when you come to the belly of the beast. And Dinesh, he's for that vertical, stepping on other people. And it's, uh, wow. So what well, we're looking at, thank you, uh, comrades uh, Saheli and B-Level, really yeah. powerful commentary. This image is a an image of a British, quote-unquote, entrepreneur, right? The the people that Dinesh D'Souza is praising. Uh, and I think uh, comrade uh, Obi had a great point, uh, but who actually built the railway? Yeah. Who, were the, who were the laborers? And it's a good point because when they the, the these colonizers go to the, the, the global south, they're like, oh, I built this. I'm like, you didn't lift a fucking finger, bro. You had other people do that shit for you. And this is a perfect example of that. This yeah. is a real photo. By the way, this is in West Bengal in, in mm. India. This is uh, a British yeah. colonizer on the back, literally, for those of you who are listening, on the back of a hunched over Bengali woman. This easily could have been, you know, one of one of one of your relatives yeah. or your grandma's, great grandma's. And this guy is just literally sitting on her back. Uh, just exploiting that. And another thing I wanted to share as well, uh, and this kind of ties into why I don't really identify with uh, quote unquote America or the United States. Uh, one of the companies that Saheli mentioned earlier, mm. uh, East India Company that starved millions of people that is responsible uh, for famines, for opioid trades, for so many horrible things. Uh, the, on the left, we see uh, the first flag of the United States, the Grand Union flag. This is the stars and the the thirteen colonies and then the the British flag on the left. It's the same flag as the British East India Company. So if you're rocking the American flag, you're rocking the flag of the East India, the British East India Company. You're rocking a colonizer flag that is responsible for mass death and and colonization in, in South Asia. And so how would I look? Imagine wearing that in in India or Bangladesh, Pakistan. That flag means genocide to them yeah. that flag means colonization and yeah. th that the, this the is union kinda... jack the union yeah. jack is on a ton of canadian like like it's on a roughly half the canadian province's flag it's on the flag of the province i live and so folks like who know our history we got to see that union jack like every day pretty much mm. <laughs> and it's, it's it's wild and that's me and ramiro we were talking about that in relation to um American socialist movements that use some of the bourgeois iconography. Um, some choose to use it, some don't around American identity. But we were saying that uh, that application of the Union Jack towards me as a heli is the same deal to uh, Black, uh, Latino, and Indigenous people in in the United States, which is important uh, for people people to really understand who may be rocking that American imagery in, with socialism. Just to think of that. No, most definitely. And just to uh, just to wrap up here, comrade, it's been a really great discussion. What I want to do, uh, wrapping up our discussion about uh, Dinesh D'Souza, this is a clip. I don't know if you guys have seen this movie, Slumdog Millionaire. It's a mm. crazy, so much propaganda. Uh, me and Ophelia saw it uh, some time back. I saw it a little bit before then when I was younger when it came out. Uh, so this is a clip from that film. That has some very interesting ideology related to the colonizer mindset, and and I like mm -hmm. the term that Saheli said about you know the a colon uh, what was it Col a colonization hangover or hang up? Um, <laughs> Is it colonial hangover? Colonial hangover. There you go. And and there's so much of this latent in this clip, so I'm gonna play this 
uh, and then we'll wrap up our discussion. This Mr. David is the biggest who we got in the whole of India. That's amazing. Come on, take a real good look at this. They say that every man in Uttar Pradesh is wearing a kurta that has been at least washed once out here. Jali, Jali! So for those of you who are listening to this as a podcast, uh, the two characters, a white American couple from the U.S. who saved this poor Indian boy from another Indian man who's uh, beating him up. A famous scene from uh, Slumdog Millionaires. Uh, Comrade Saheli, your analysis and reaction to this, and also just kind of wrapping up, your what are your thoughts on the how the portrayals of South Asians in media and also uh, the right wing ideology that that you guys are bombarded with? So this is a like this was an Indian U.S. Uh, joint production. So one can imagine that there would be this colonial and racist hierarchies there and yes you again see the white civilized people they're trying like white civilized woman trying to save this poor indian boy from his own people so this is what exactly dinesh was mentioning in that clip that you showed earlier that (laughs) yes right white savior so this is exactly what dinesh was saying in that clip earlier when he said a bit differently that Christianity, the fact that Christianity came to India with the Europeans, that's what he said. The fact that the British brought Christianity to India, civilized Indians, they brought so like with them, they brought the Western values and they invite people with the Western values. And that the, he, according to him, the Christianity that the British brought was something of equality and of white and um, darker peoples being on the same level and there are not being any caste hierarchies. First of all, let me mention that there is caste system in India, not just in Hindu religion, but also in Christianity as well as in Islam. It may not exist in other places, but it exists in India because the caste hierarchy of the Hindu religion is carried over, even if you convert to other religions. So that's that's that could be a discussion entirely for another day, but anyway, yeah. um, that's that's one thing that uh, Dinesh did not mention. And then he said that black and white people were considered the same in Christianity. Now, of course, I'm sure that Jesus considered that, but yeah. the British did not. So even tell it to the Caribbean. <laughs> so even even if they were to the Indians who had converted to Christianity, they were still dark people. So they were still uncivilized and everything. So they were still not considered, of course, they were still not considered equal. So there was still racism and still this hierarchies of the Indians being on a lower level and the British being on the upper, the white saviors trying to save poor us from our crazy ideas and what we did not know. <laughs> like we were uncivilized, right? So they were trying to civilize us and all that. So this is exactly this uh, white savior concept white severe idea is also this is a manifestation of white supremacy and that is exactly what we are seeing in this film in the clip of this film in slumdog millionaire that you were showing that uh, the white people were white woman was and it, it is always a woman because one can say that the softer sentiments would be with women more and this white woman was trying to save 
uh, dark boy from his own people from being beaten up and all that and then you'll see the other one the white man giving him money so it's like it's a poor boy if you give money every problem will be solved so that's like that's great capitalism right so these are the this is how this clip the, the one that you showed from slums of millionaire in my opinion ties up to what uh, dinesh d'souza was saying just a little while ago most definitely thank you so much for that uh, comrade sahelvi and comrade b level your final thoughts on all this your analysis and what should be done for the South Asian revolutionary diaspora? Because like you said, there's not too many voices yeah. putting out communism and socialism. The right wing has Dinesh and other people. Uh, what do you yeah. see forward as a path forward? And, and also just to kind of wrap up as well, B-Level, uh, your thoughts on how that relates as well to plurinationalism. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I think it's coming close to the end of the program for you. I know uh, perhaps plurinationalism nationalism might be one we could do a part two on to really get into how that would apply to subcontinents, to Latin America, as well as to North America, to the islands. But to close on Dinesh, I think the clip you showed was fantastic because it summarizes a lot of ideas we've been talking about this entire podcast. And I really like that both uh, you and Saheli have been mentioning in the clip, not only do the white folks uh, you know, kind of coddle the kid, give him some money. This is the real America. It shows a uh, older brown man beating the kid up and the, wh the white couple from America stopping him from doing that. And me and Ramiro, we've done a lot of podcasts pointing out the, the concept of the Oriental despot. Shout out to our man, Ajay Therapal, another cousin in the diaspora. He does great content there pointing out that there's this current trend under quote unquote uh, woke or uh, progressive imperialism to attack these supposed strong men leaders or these strong leaders in the global south to liberate the poor oppressed dark masses from their own evil patriarchal uh, leaders right and it's only going to be the lily white civility of the west that will do this and show us their genteel ways and spread that civilization as Dinesh said and unfortunately i think that is the biggest hang-up amongst the, the diaspora is the dependence upon the West to give the fruit and the nectar to our peoples to live a good life because fundamentally it's come and stole your wealth, right? You know, the Commonwealth, they took all of that from the subcontinent that's in the global North now and they're, they're trickling a little pieces of that back to us as opposed to ourselves working to build socialism. Like for example, the Chinese nation has and the incredible steps they've done there. And Vijay Prashad gets into this, and I've talked about this a little too, is with the, amongst South Asian right-wingers, they got a little jealousy of the Chinese. They see what mm. China has done for themselves, and they're jealous of that, and they hate on that. But, you know, China is balling. They're doing incredible things. And I would love to see uh, South Asian subcontinent rocking that social. The stuff we see in Kerala spread all across the subcontinent you know, unify and be part of this new pan-Asianism around the One Belt Road project. But the fundamental uh, struggle for revolutionaries in the diaspora is we've got the twofold thing. We got to combat the overall right wing, you know, amongst the Anglosphere, but also the right wing within our own diaspora. And we're seeing, uh, you know, Ramiro, you've talked about this with uh, Erica and Salifu on the Candace Owens episode amongst uh you know the, the african diaspora in the united states you've got bourgeoisie members more recently as well in parallel to the model minority thing being pointed to as hey you know just aspire to become a middle a middle manager at the belly of the beast mm -hmm. as opposed to be a revolutionary social so we're seeing this this issue as saheli pointed out across all of our communities that are rooted in the global south is this idea be a middle manager of the, the the white man's game, the rich white man's game. <laughs> the real solidarity we're gonna see from white folks is Irish rebels blowing up Lord Mountbatten's car, not an American couple giving a, a poor boy a, a $10 bill. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this, the struggle the struggle goes, oh no, oh no. This is an image of a protester in Hong Kong, a, oh. obviously Chinese woman waving a British flag and wearing a British flag shirt and says, make Hong Kong great Britain again. So this is what oh, we're wow. up against. They need this some is... Xi Jinping in their life. They need some <laughs> Xi Jinping. Uh, but uh, 
<laughs> yeah, and I want to shout out to a really good episode Ramiro did on his uh, classic decolonizing media series back mm. on He's uh, You did a really good episode that I watched in prep for this about how the concept of the wealth of nations is distorted by people like the Nesh D'Souza, where they say, hey, the poverty of the subcontinent or the poverty of the ghetto or the poverty of the reserve is a cultural pathology. And there are going to be mm. a few bright, talented 10 that rise up. Everyone else is a lost cause. You know, what's going to happen to them? They, maybe the white man will save them. I don't know. And that's kind of what's pushed. But we got to push that when we organize ourselves, all of our nations have that internationalism. We can strive for a better world and a dignified life for all of our people. It doesn't have to come at the hands of the, the colonizer power, the imperialist powers. That's what I had to say closing off the day. And uh, so, Haley, awesome streaming with you. And I hope we can do more to, to wake our people up, let people know what's up, and uh, bring it to Dinesh and debate him IRL one day. <laughs> Thank you, B-Level. So, Haley, you need, will I, one last thing you want to say? Okay, no, not much. Thanks a lot to both of you, Ramiro, for this space. And, of course, B-Level. I mean, I have been watching both of you for a long time, so it was nice to be here. Yes, and also nice to see B level like how he looks like. Although, oh yeah, he has not, <laughs> although you. he has not shown his face now, he showed his face before, so that's something. Okay, so that's nice. He's so, a Chad. Um, He's a Chad. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you're, you're <awesome. laughs> well, you know, I I did not even know these terms a few years earlier, so that's something. <laughs> He's well, you're, 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 both, you're both gorgeous people inside and out, revolutionary <laughs> comrades. And I, there's so, actually one thing I should shout out to, to all our people yeah. listening. Saheli mentioned this, and it's an important point. I think Ramiro also touched upon this, is the first wave that comes here, they want to lie low. They don't want to cause trouble. And for me and Saheli as revolutionaries, we understand that. And it's often the next wave, you know, kids like me, kids like Himmy G that grow up here, the belly of the beast is all they know. And they're ready to bring it. So everyone out there, have empathy for those that kind of got you here and pay respect to that. Pay respect to all the struggles of our people by, by bringing that revolutionary knowledge. That's what I got to add is the last point. Most definitely. Thank you so much, uh, comrades B-Level and comrades Saheli. I really appreciate you guys coming on. I'd love to have you back on soon. We're going to go out to some revolutionary music from the Communist Party of India Marxist uh, Telugu. Uh, the Telugu people are native to southern Indian states of Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, and Yanam uh, Puducherry. I'm sorry if I butchered that. Uh, but basically, what is beautiful about this song is that the, the Telugu people in India are some of the most oppressed, colonized uh, people in India who have been suppressed for so long by the ruling class. And the Communist Party of India, Marxist, has a very strong organizing apparatus in among the Telugu people. Uh, so we're going to go out to some of this. And thank you so much to everybody for watching and listening. Take care. Communist Genula jivita lu marcha jenda lai kadili naamu kovva tila karigi pothu prajala koraku velugu thamu Vaatti maaku nerpe namma poru tattvamu Yenta goppa dhamma aasai dhantika tattvamu Vaatti maaku nerpe namma poru tattvamu Yenta goppa dhamma aasai dhantika tattvamu Communist to lam Surulam Communist Lam, me Mukaria Surulam Salu Deshalu Party near Paledu Mantralu Kutantralu Party Tilu Paledu Salu Deshalu Party near Paledu Mantralu Kutantralu Party Tilu Paledu
మూఢాచార నమ్మకాలు బీడ మంది పార్టీ కుల మతాల కుష్టితాలు కూడదంది పార్టీ ముగ్గు పాలతో మానవత్వమును కలిపి తాపినాది ఉద్యమాల ఊయలలో మమ్ము ఊపినాది మమ్ము ఊపినాది కమ్యూనిస్టులం కార్యసూరులం కమ్యూనిస్టులం మేము కార్యసూరులం జనుల జీవితాలు మార్చ చెండాలై కదిలినాము కొత్తిల కరిగిపోతు ప్రజల కొరకు వెలుగుతాము సేద్యం ఎన్నాళ్ళని కుమ్ములుతున్న అన్నదాత రైతన్నకు అండగా నిలవమంది ఈ సేద్యం ఎన్నాళ్ళని కుమ్ములుతున్న అన్నదాత రైతన్నకు అండగా నిలవమంది ఫ్యాక్టరీల కొట్టాలకు పొగ చూరిన కార్మికుల కన్నీళ్లను తుడిచేందుకు సైరనల్లే మంది పిడికిళ్లనే కొడవళ్ళుగా మార్చి చూపినాది పిడివాదుల గుండెల్లోనా పిడుగులు కురిపించినాది పిడుగులు కురిపించినాది కమ్యూనిస్టులం మే కార్యసూరులం